seen our presentation for an intelligent ground vehicle solution. Uh, the rest of the members of Team Secrets are Randall Evans, Donald Bosnowski, Raleigh Dent, and Jesse Howard. The concept behind our project is a fully autonomous vehicle, which is the next step in robot evolution. Uh, there are many competitions uh, to advance the research in this field in both the uh, private and defense industry. The concept behind our project was the Intelligent Ground Vehicle Competition. The, intelligent ground, the IGBC provided the guidelines for our project, and this is actually considerable for the time in the competition. The competition is broken into uh, two parts. There's the actual ground vehicle design, there's also the interoperability challenge. The ground vehicle design is exactly as it sounds, a vehicle that has to maintain contact with the ground. It can have various drive systems, such as uh, wheels or track drive, but it must navigate from point A to point B, staying within a bounded lane, and the lane is bounded on either side by a white line depending on the ground. For the interoperability challenge, uh, must demonstrate that it can communicate with a command and control structure using a prescribed protocol. And this will actually be the first year we re-enter that part of the challenge. Uh, the team's entry into the competition is Spike, a self-propelled intelligent kinetic entity. Um, the team began by developing an outline for the project, um, but one of the First things, caveats we had was that since this was an electrical engineering course, we would maintain the existing uh, mechanical and physical design of the vehicle and try to enhance the sensory and control design. Um, the first three areas we really wanted to concentrate on were, of course, the requirements, and those were governed by the contest rules. Uh, then we did an evaluation by meeting with past team members and also just the performance of how the vehicle performs now. And then, since we had kind of limited robotics experience, we wanted to research into the control structure for robotics. Uh, this led us into uh, path planning. Path planning is the actual decision-making process for how the robot's going to navigate. Uh, we looked at several of those. There was A-STAR, uh, there was simultaneous location and mapping, and of course there was uh, kind of an ad hoc real-time that we would develop ourselves. We kind of did a hybrid of uh, A-STAR and the real-time. Um, there was also the last two were somewhat interdependent on one another. That was the operating system for the laptop, as well as the control software for the, uh, the, all the processes, to bring all the processes together. Uh, since we had limited experience in Linux, we decided to stay with the Windows operating system. And then the, for the control software, we looked at robot operating system or LabVIEW. Um, since LabVIEW has an extensive library and it also integrates well with most of the hardware out there and many of the vendors, we went ahead and decided to stay with LabVIEW. Um, now to talk about our central hardware is uh, Randall Evans. So like everyone here, Spike is dependent on sensory inputs to understand the world around it. The two navigational inputs are um, fairly common and their operations are understood. GPS relies on satellite triangulation so that Spike can determine its location in relation to its wakeup destination. Compasses rely on those magnetic fields and they were necessary so that Spike could determine its orientation. The next two light on optics for the optical detection uh, required a bit more insight uh, for us to effectively utilize the data being output. <coughs> um, LIDAR was used for object detection and the, the way it works is it emits a laser and detects variation in the light reflection. Uh, those variations occur when an obstacle is present. <coughs> And the unit will perform its operation continuously in a 240-degree sweep, as seen here, and plot the uh, magnitude and angle at which these variations or obstacles are present. Next, for the optical sensor, optical sensor, uh, which is really our only option for line detection, uh, it's essentially a 2D array, which all the pixels in this 2D array are assigned real-world distances. Uh, the output 32-bit color image is then converted to an 8-bit uh, monochromatic image. That 8-bit monochromatic image is then filtered to a single-bit binary image, uh, which basically the 
light pixels will fall uh, above a assigned threshold and dark pixels will fall below the assigned threshold. Obviously, the light pixels being the line, of course. Then we have a grid that searches the image and plots points as you see anytime it detects an interface between a dark and light pixel. Uh, these groups of pixels have uh, then have a best fit line fitted to them, and the best, best fit line is then uh, interpreted as the boundaries of the navigation operation. Uh, our single output is a pulse width modulated signal generated by a microcontroller, which in turn fetches an H bridge, which uh, the positive and negative bearing voltages to the motors allow the spike to move forward, reverse, and forward turn. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Donnie and explain how we're using these outputs and inputs in our pathfinding algorithm. I'm going to talk a little bit about the decision making process um, that is behind Spike. Um, this involves two parts. The first part is the determination of a target bearing, and the second part is an obstacle of line detection and avoidance. Um, for the target bearing, we determined the, a probability function for each of the current bearing and the target GPS waypoint bearing. From this, uh, we take these two functions and then we weight those uh, accordingly and combine those functions into a total probability function. From that, we can determine as the maximum probability will be our target bearing. Um, once an obstacle is detected between the path uh, between the vehicle and the target GPS waypoint, um, the obstacle avoidance will begin to take place, which is an integration of these two methods. Um, at first, the real-time uh, the obstacle avoidance algorithm will take a snapshot from all of the sensors and plot this information onto a grid. Once this grid is formed, it will be passed to the A-star pathfinding algorithm, which will determine the least cost path to the destination. This is a brief example of the target bearing calculation. As you can see, there are two um, two triangle functions, which are um, the probability functions that are pre-weighted for the vehicle orientation as well as the GPS offset. Once those two probability functions are combined, we get the solid line, um, which as you can see for this example is centered at 60 degrees, which would be our target bearing, which falls in between the peaks of the two probability functions. Uh, next I'm going to show you a short or a short animation which describes this process. Uh, first, the input from the camera, as Randy showed you, will be inputted into the equation. This, uh, these lines will be sampled at a specified rate. Um, once this data is generated, it will be passed into an array and stored. Next, the data from the LiDAR will also be entered into this and stored in the same array. All of these data points will then be rounded and placed on a grid. These grid points um, will also be defined with a threshold around them. And this threshold will maintain a distance that makes it so the center of the vehicle will not, uh, will maintain an appropriate distance from each of these points. Once this is complete, all of these areas will be defined as high cost areas at a value of 100, and all the empty areas in the grid will be defined as a low cost of 1. Once this is complete, the current heading and GPS bearing will be used to determine the target bearing. This point will associate itself with a point on the grid as the target destination for the current map. Um, this grid, along with our current location and the target destination, will be passed into the ASTAR algorithm, which will then generate the target path. Once that's complete, this target path will allow us to um, calculate our target forward and angular velocity. And now I'm going to pass it over to Raleigh for the interoperability. I'm going to explain the interoperability profile of Travis to you all. All right. 
Well, first of all, what is an IOD? Well, the Department of Defense has provided to the Joint Project Office as to find these IOBs in order to enhance the ability of hardware and software to operate together with minimal effort by an end user. There is one particular IOP that we use for this challenge, and that's the JALUS Profile and Rules IOP. And what this IOP does is it defines how JALUS ensures that this interoperability. But what is JALUS? Well, JALUS stands for Joint Architecture for Un uh, Unmanned Systems. It is an open architecture that is managed by the Society of Automotive Engineers. It defines the uh, communication protocols needed in order to ensure this in uh, interoperability between an unmanned system and an operator control station. I'm going to explain to you now what a subsystem is and what a JTC is. And then we'll be used extensively in the context of my discussion. All right, what is a subsystem? A subsystem is any entity that runs JAWS compliant software. In our, in our case, it is a laptop that we use at, at the competition. JTC stands for Judges Test Client. This is the entity that will be <coughs> testing how JAWS compliant our subsystem is. At, at the competition, uh, competition and for testing purposes here at the Citadel. But what type of software did we need to order in, in order to compete at the competition? Well, we started with a review of all the various JAWS compliant software development kits that are available on uh, to use this like, like us. We chose one in, um, in particular, it's called JTS, JAWS Preset. And we chose this one in particular because it has an active support form, has a detailed user guide, and it's free software underneath the BSD license. Now, once we run um, this J JTS and we're inside of it creating a component, in which I will get into later about what a component is, we create the component in JTS, and JTS auto generates this in C code and configures it into a project file. So we go outside of JTS and we go into the C++ project file in the uh, Visual Studio and we implement the attributes, the IOB attributes that we need to, in order to compete, successfully compete at this challenge. Now once we have uh, completed those attributes and we got the project file constructed and compiled, then we run this, run the executable from the command line. Now, once this component is running, then that subsystem is now able to receive messages from any client, from any JAWS compliant client, and also act on those messages. Now, I'll explain to you how we create a JAWS message and JAWS component. Well, we use a bottom to top approach. First, we start with simple fields, and then we put those simple fields into, comp in a, into one or more complex fields. And then we take those complex fields and we put those into a uh, JAWS message. And then we take those messages and put that into an input set or an output set. And along with that, we define the protocol behavior of the messages using statement chains. Now we take the input set, the output set, and the protocol behavior, and we put that into a service definition. And we take one more service definition to put into a service set. And we take a service set and we put that into a component. Now, now I'll explain to you the component that we use at the competition and also the service definitions. The component in particular is called Platform Manager. And there are two service definitions underneath that component that, are, that is of relevance to this discussion. First is the transport service uh, definition. And what this service does is it acts as an interface to transport letter. <coughs> this uh, diagram right here shows the transport service right here, acting as an interface to the transport layer. The transport service, it serves as a bi-directional communication link that whose primary function is to enable the subsystem to receive messages from the source and also to send back JALS compliant messages back to that same source. Now, the second one is called the discovery service. And this service's primary function is to enable our subsystem and other subsystems to know of us on, on the same network. Now, this service is always in a ready state. It's always waiting for a trigger. In particular, the secret diagram 
describes the uh, sequences of message passing that happen between our subsystem and the client. Here we have the JTC broadcast a query identification message out to all the subsystems on that network. Our subsystem recognizes this as a trigger, goes through the state machine, formulates a response with data fields containing our identification. Then, now that the JTC knows of us on the network, then it sends the queries services that we can provide to the JTC or whoever wants to control our unmanned system. So ne next, we report back those, su those services to the JTC or whoever queried us. And then after that, the JTC knows what we're doing. <coughs> All right, that concludes the explanation of the ILP challenge, and I'll hand it off to Jesse Hudd to conclude our presentation. How's everybody doing today? I'm going to tie it all together into um, conclusion. And um, the development of, the autonom of our autonomous ground vehicle to compete in the, uh, in the IGBC was broken down into two, uh, two categories. The first category was the uh, auto navigation um, a preparation challenge, and the second category was an interoperability profile uh, preparation challenge. Now, after the studying the design of the previous team and deciding upon a plan of attack, a real-time decision-making algorithm was decided upon. And uh, upon implementation of, of this uh, real-time uh, algorithm, it was basically based on the distance between uh, the, the shortest distance between two points. But there arose a problem when our robot spike was, uh, was between two objects uh, had, uh, angles of equal distance. And so it was decided that a, a real-time probability algorithm would resolve this issue. And upon implementation of this real-time uh, algorithm, probability algorithm, it was realized that not only did it resolve the problem of spike getting to a point of freezing, but it actually uh, enhanced the overall performance of our robot. And so the last challenge that we were left with was to implement the, uh, we had a digital camera and we needed to integrate that um, with the probability algorithm that we had just, um, we just thought of. So um, we began working on it and then we, we realized that as we were working on it that we could utilize um, LabVIEW's A-star algorithm. Um, and, and, with, and what the A-star algorithm we did for us was basically it reduced the uh, volatility of the optical inputs uh, that, we were, that we were receiving. And then once we implemented uh, the A-star algorithm in, into our uh, program, we actually, uh, it resulted in the successful and reliable um, implementation of avoidance, uh, of spikes avoidance of obstacles and, uh, and lines. And that was, uh, that was what we uh, hoped for, and that was our goal. And this is the Citadel's uh, first entry into the uh, challenge that addresses JAWS. And the JAWS implementation Basically, it enhances um, the subsystem um, and enables um, the, um, the interoperability, um, uh, interoperability capability um, for an unmanned system. And so, this capability was proven and um, was proven and demonstrated an actual demonstration by a JAWS a JAWS compliant message. JAWS compliant message was basically was received was, was received from the, the client over a wireless over a wireless network and then a JAWS compliant response was generated and it was passed back to the client um, from the server and this concludes our presentation and we now open the floor to any questions that you may have. Thank you for the we, we've been doing lots and lots of testing, um, but the trouble with here is uh, we've had tons and tons of rain, uh, or at least every day we try and test it. But uh, you know, we we uh, see uh, we see it just run out really well. Uh, hopefully, place in the top five. Not least. That's our goal. When you're uh, when you're designing the optical traveling to, to follow the lines and with the lidar to detect the object, if, if the event arose where you didn't have a one path to go through, it had to travel through a hundred paths, would it choose to do that, or it would choose to? Yeah.
Yes, if there, were, if there were no other options, um, then it would choose the, still choose the least cost path. And it, the, the least cost path is determined by the addition of all of the nodes as it travels. So um, in that instance, the least cost path would include going through 100 uh, levels. But hopefully stay in the bounds and not hit an obstacle. Yeah. Other questions? What you guys